The Watership Down podcast is intended for listeners who are familiar with the plot. There will be spoilers. This episode is scripted, narrated and edited by Newell Fisher, and this week's showcase image is by Samantha Lee. Hello, and welcome to the Watership Down podcast episode 120 on a hot June day with the windows open, in which I'll be reviewing the first substantial academic work on the 1978 film of Watership Down. Its title is Watership Down, Perspectives on and Beyond Animated Violence, and it is edited by Catherine Lester, lecturer on film and television in the Department of Film and Creative Writing at the University of Birmingham. It is published by Bloomsbury. First, though, a bit of burrow keeping. Can I remind you again about our appeal to raise funds for the Rabbit Welfare Association and Fund via JustGiving.com, the link to which will be in the notes, or just search JustGiving.com under my name, Newell Fisher. The appeal has raised £151 so far, if the initial Facebook appeal is added in, which is fantastic. My goal is to get to £1,000. Please give what you can. This is a very worthy charity helping a pet that is often mis- badly misunderstood in this country. Rabbits deserve the same protection as cats and dogs. Next, if you're listening to this on YouTube or have looked at any of the podcast social media, you may have noticed that the podcast title image on the right has changed from the normal one I've used since episode 100. This is because I've decided, after what I said last week, to use that right-hand podcast title panel as a way of showcasing Watership Down fan art. This won't happen every week unless I get a piece of art submitted to me to use. If I don't, the normal image will be used. This just seems the best way to showcase such art, as the episode titles for the TV series, obviously, are going to be screenshots from the series. This week's showcase was submitted by Samantha Lee, who is Samantha underscore Lee underscore Lapa, L-A-P-I-N, on Instagram. It was created using watercolour and gold leaf and is titled No Bargains. Fantastic work, Samantha, and welcome to the Owsler. There will be a link to her art in the notes. Also, I forgot to welcome Inika Kalkman to the Owls last week after using her painting as the episode title panel. My apologies, Inika. Yours was the first Warship Down fan art I've used in this way, so you have more than earned membership. Next, the new audiobook of Tales from Warship Down, narrated by Simon Vance, is now available. It seems to be a single voice narration, which may be preferable to the other version, depending on your taste. I'm neutral on this, personally. Multiple voices done well can be very effective, but equally, so could a good single voice. Worth checking out. Link in the notes. So then, let's get into some serious detail about a film about rabbits. Review of Watership Down, Perspectives on and Beyond Animated Violence, edited by Catherine Lester. I first contacted Dr Catherine Lester about her book a year ago, around the time I became aware that it was going to be published. I received my review copy of the book in February this year, and yes, for full disclosure, it was a free copy. If you want to buy a copy, there is a link in the notes. Just be aware that being an academic text, it isn't cheap. However, there is also a link to the free online copy of the full text. Now, while I say I received a review copy, I cannot claim to be much of a book reviewer, having hardly ever actually reviewed a book. What follows will probably be more of a summary of what the book says, with me throwing in a few comments of my own as they occur to me. If that counts as a review, then all is well. I was initially fascinated to see how an entire book of this length had been written about this one film. However, that fascination soon changed to understanding very well how this was possible. The 1978 film of All Ship Down is a fascinating cultural phenomenon, even to anyone without without any special interest in the book, but only in the history of film, and in particular animation. I was determined to do this book justice, so I have not skimmed through it, and as a result it has taken me since February to give it my full attention, my life being the way it is these days. It was worth taking the time. The book is divided into four sections, and is a collection of academic essays. The sections are titled... Bringing the Warren to Life, which broadly deals with the production of the film, Animal Stories, which looks at changes in the way animals were represented in film, particularly around the time the film was made, Aesthetics of Sound and Image, which looks at the use of music and imagery in the film, and Effective and Ethical Encounters with the Rabbit, which looks at the ethics of the film. I should point out that, not by design, my review is quite heavily slanted towards the last two parts of the book, and particularly part four, probably because I found those the most interesting personally. 
The sections of the actual book are quite similar in length, and there is a lot I'm missing out, obviously. In the introduction, Catherine Lester sets out a very interesting initial premise for the book by suggesting that all animated output at the time the film was made was basically a reaction to Disney, which had laid the ground rules for decades. Martin Rosen intended the initial promotion for the film, featuring the silhouetted rabbit in a snare, to act as a warning for the content. As someone who was taken to see it at the age of 11, I can confirm that this did not work. Subsequent marketing of physical copies of the film became more child-friendly, culminating in the early 2000s edition I used to analyse it. As this process happened, people of roughly my age were increasingly giving their accounts of how much it had traumatised them as children, having themselves become parents, of course. The recent reclassification of the film to a parental guidance rating of the UK was partially as a result of decisions to air the film at times aimed at children, such as on Easter Sunday afternoon. Lester takes us through the representation journey that Warship Down went through in the 40 years between the first film in 1978 and the latest Netflix adaptation in 2018. Interestingly, Rosen was partially motivated to make the 1999 TV series, falling halfway through that period as an act of atonement for the violence of his original film. Part 1, on the film's production, opens with an essay about film financing as it relates to the film, written by Luella and James Chapman. They write about the gritty reality of British film finances in the 70s. Warship Down so nearly didn't get made, not least with the lack of certainty about animated film schedules coming from the producer. It really is incredible that an animated film like this was made in Britain in the 1970s by producers with so little animation experience. They really should have fallen at the first hurdle. Fortunately they didn't, but it wasn't easy. It is fascinating to hear some of the initial casting proposals at this stage in the film's development, and there's a fuller table of these in the book. Michael Caine was pro proposed to play Hazel, Dudley Moore as Fiverr, and Helen Mirren as Heisenthal. Now, speaking personally, that last option would have very much have worked, and Dudley Moore as Fiverr? Yes, that might have worked as well. But Michael Caine as Hazel? At this point, I was so tempted to impersonate him, saying they were only supposed to dig the Emblea burrow, but I resisted. The film hit immediate problems when the producer, Martin Rosen, got rid of the initial director, Mike Hubley. The reasons behind this, apparently, were tensions over artistic vision versus integrity of story and character. The schedule for the film was affected badly by the sacking of Hubley, and the film's financiers nearly took over production. After the film was released, Rosen, who took over as director, having never directed an animation before, displayed humility and offered his services cheap to the financiers as a joke. Chapter 2, written by Clive and Nigel Humberston and Chris Pallant, revisits the production of the film via the Arthur Humberston Animation Archive. Arthur Humberston, who is the lead animator on Watership Down, worked on Animal Farm, 1954, which is well worth a watch. One of the reasons for the success of Watership Down in the face of such adversity was that Rosen's inexperience in animation led to a far more collaborative practice than seemed to have been usual at the time. One result of this was the evolution of, of the representation of the rabbits in the film to look more naturalistic. This seems to have been largely as a result of Arthur Humberston's in input. Rosen, who had only ever produced live-action films before, trusted his judgement. Chapter 3, A Lapine Corpus by R. Grider, is fascinating, though I haven't quite got my head around its inclusion in this section. I suppose it relates to script development. In any case, I'm very glad it was included. The essay takes a fascinating approach to look at the use of English by rabbits as translated lapine. Rewatching the film with this focus is an interesting experience. So, for example, when Bigwig calls the road a man thing, what was the word or phrase he actually used? And the selection of when to use English or lapine in both book and film is interesting. For example, in the book, Bigwig is mostly only called Flaley when he is undercover in Ephrafa, almost as if it is a nom de guerre. On the other hand, Fiverr, again in the book, is only called Frere Roux as a term of affection. In the film, Lapine is used impressively without explanation, though I think its use is quite limited. The viewer is just expected to pick up on context, an example being the word farm, another being Ausler. Part 2, Animal Stories, opens with Chapter 4, Animating Utopia, written by Lisa Mullen, who asks the question, is it possible to tell a story about talking animals without creating an allegory? 
She discusses Watership Down as a tale of the impossibility of utopia, as well as discussing at length the potential power of animation's exaggerated forms to influence an audience. In doing so, she subjects the film to an actual Marxist analysis, as opposed to the tongue-in-cheek one I started to use when talking about the Warren of the Snares in episode 9. The example of Donald Duck always getting his comeuppance is given. What ethical standards are being taught here when you strip away the humour of the slapstick? In Warship Down, the physics of the world are far more like ours, with the main divergence from our world being rabbits with a wide range of human-like facial expressions in close-ups. This, is, it is argued, is actually a film about a people in adversity, not rabbits. And the so-called cunning of rabbits is actually code for human revolutionary endeavour in the face of an oppressor. It was one of my favourite chapters, you may not be surprised to hear. Chapter 5, Human-Animal Conflict in 70s Children's Cinema by Noel Brown, contrasts four key animal-themed children's films in the 70s with the less brutal Disney version of children's films. The four films being Ring of Right Water, The Bellstone Fox, Tarka the Otter and Warship Down. Animals were a preoccupation of British children's cinema of the period, which puts Warship Down in context. These films were more about human nature antagonism than cooperation, and interestingly, children were almost absent from them. The human threat in Watership Down is more abstract than the three live-action films. All four present humanity as the other, and emerge from a time when the green movement was emerging, and ironically, you might say, lessening the contrast between human and animal. At the time these four films were made, young people were thought to be more able to absorb such depictions of the human relationship to nature. Of those four films, I'm most familiar with The Bellstone Fox, which made quite an impression on me when I first saw it in my early teens. I recommend it. Chapter 6 on Warship Down and the Animals of Farthing Wood is written by Holly Adams, who is a teacher. She sets out the development of the Green Movement in the UK around the time the book Warship Down was written and the film made, and then asks why we should water down environmental impacts on animals for children before introducing the concept of eco-pedagogy, or raising awareness of environmental impact in the young. Adams then gives examples from Warship Down, as well as Animals of Farthing Wood, of the representation of negative human impacts on animals. However, the latter also includes examples of plain human carelessness, as well as showing some humans taking a more caring attitude towards nature. My own thought on this was, might the concept of eco-pedagogy be seen as propaganda or education? This all depends on the science, I guess, and the science is very much in favour of the environmentalist perspective. But there will always be those who say this isn't the function of education. In which case, what is? Chapter 7 is on Watership Down, Down Under, meaning in Australia, and is written by Dan and Linus Tor. Apologies if I've massacred their names. It centres, unsurprisingly, on the problematic relationship between humans and rabbits in Australia, where their epidemic breeding in an ecology they had not evolved in was first dealt with via a large rabbit meat and fur industry, then later with the introduction of the diseases myxomatosis and RHDV. In terms of film, animations involving native Australian animals often failed outside Australia at first, while in Australia, rabbits on film have been paralleled with the human invaders and thropomorphising them into the role of European settlers dominating the native Aborigines. The cartoon Dot and the Kangaroo, based on an 1899 book, did well outside Australia and a sequel featured a rabbit. Funnily enough, this film features an Aborigine-inspired myth sequence at the start while the one at the start of Watership Down also had similar artistic influences. The reception of the book and film of Watership Down was slow in Australia, possibly due to attitudes towards rabbits, and the main interest in the film was the initial composer, Malcolm Williamson, who was Australian. There is a discussion about Wallace and Gromit and the Curse of the Weir Rabbit and Peter Rabbit as more contemporary parallels for rabbit infestation. Rabbits, especially in Australia, are often looked upon as animal weeds, and what a horrendous, I almost wrote, dehumanising phrase that is. But, the authors assert, the definition of a weed can be challenged. After all, a weed is just a plant in the wrong place from a human perspective. But human perspectives can change. Part 3 Aesthetics of Sound and Image opens with Chapter 8 on the musical score of the film, written by Paul Maisie. Angela Morley, who created the musical score for her film, studied composition with the composer for Animal Farm, 1954. 
She gave up film work in 1960 because of concerns over quality, but later relented, going on to work with some of John Williams' scores for Superman and Star Wars. The original composer for Watership Down, Malcolm Williamson, became overwhelmed with work for the Queen's Silver Jubilee in 1977 and had to be replaced. Morley worked with the basics he had produced and came up with the rest herself in a very short space of time. The style was pastoral, with lots of woodwind and slow tempo. This style started in the 19th century to distinguish British music from that of mainland Europe. This accompanied the transition from the countryside being largely seen as a place of work to a place of leisure. I think this style being used in the film is quite ironic, as the countryside is very much a place of work for rabbits. Four main musical themes are used in the film. The main title, heard four times and associated with Watership Down itself. Venturing forth, heard five times, such as when Hazel and Fiverr are first seen. This is a gentle theme and was the first to be composed by Morley. Quest, heard 15 times and themed on the search for a new home, a strident theme and useful for bridging between episodes. And Violet's Gone, heard five times, a melancholy theme associated with hard parts of the journey to Watership Down. Other small themes contrasted with the pastoral style, such as Fiverr's vision or Kihar's theme, which was deliberately waltz-like and therefore a little foreign from a British perspective, of course. The pastoral watercolours of the film's backgrounds work with these themes, as well as foreground elements such as waving grasses. The music was written after the visuals were complete, which was a reversal of the norm then. Two good examples of the film's music working with the camera shots and dialogue are given, Fiverr's speech after the snare and climbing watership down. The pastoral theme was intended to work with Adam's love of the countryside, and Morley was not only a composer, but also a ranger. This showed her experience of the pastoral tradition. Chapter 9, on music and stroke as horror, was written by Leanne Weston, who opens by saying that Watership Down has been discussed in two ways in relation to its music, as cute and as horror. The latter has become more prominent as time passes. The interesting idea is introduced of just listening to the film as a radio play. Removed from its visual context, how does it sound? What kind of film would you say it is? This is a worthwhile exercise that I plan to try sometime. Notions of genre and how these are constructed are discussed. A film not intended for a genre may end up being culturally judged as belonging to it. The film has blood, violence and gore, the basic requirements of horror, and some of the music fits the genre. My own strong example of this would be the climactic theme as Woundwart pushes Bigwig back during their fight. Fiverr is a focus for the film's horror and emotion. We share his visions as an audience. No other character does. The music associated with him reflects this, while Hazel is the film's moral centre. Horror music is said to be assaultive in character, and that certainly applies in the most horrific scenes in this film. Does the dramatic opening fanfare set the tone? Descriptions of the music in subtitles and the music chosen in YouTube remixes are very telling of the film's tone, an example being the use of death metal for the destruction of Sandalford. Overall, the essay concludes that the musical legacy of the film and its reinterpretation helps to explain its longevity. Chapter 10 on colour in Watership Down is written by Carolyn Rickards. She opened by saying that in Watership Down, the fantasy of talking animals is subdued by a more realistic setting and that in contrast to Disney, British animation of the period had quite subdued colour palettes. Greens and browns evoke an Arcadian vision of the English countryside. The sudden intrusion of brighter colours, in particular red, symbolised the intrusion of the human world, for example, the red sports car on the road. At this point, there is a reference to the train, later in the film, glistening red, which it does not. This was the only blatant error about the film I found in the book. Cowslips Warren is also unnaturally colourful in comparison to the rest of the film. Does this all point towards a strange aspect of Western culture in which excessive colour is often seen as a threat, in particular red, the main colour associated with Fiverr's initial vision? The eventual destruction of Sandalford is also portrayed in bright colours, symbolising its separation from the natural world. Ephrafa, in contrast, is portrayed in subdued greys, symbolising the boredom of totalitarianism, while Fiverr's vision of the injured Hazel uses bright colours, possibly symbolising the closeness of his death, as in the destruction of Sandalford. Black is used sparingly in the film, as in the opening void before Frith appears. Overall, Rickard says, colour, in particular vivid colour, allows us into the inner psyches and beliefs of these rabbits. Chapter 11 
Art Styles and the Depiction of Violence is written by Sam Summers, who points out that the stylized massacre of rabbits at the start of the film is never cited as an example of its violence because it is so removed from reality. Though I would comment that it was probably still, possibly still shocking at the time for such concentrated killing to appear in any animation. We go from this to the most realistic shot of a rabbit in the film, that of Hazel sitting quietly in undergrowth, then to their default appearance without fur in detail. The film uses such shifts in artistic style at key moments throughout. Maureen Furness has come up with a continuum of, of animation styles that varies between complete imitation of reality to complete abstraction. Most animation, including Watership Down 1978, falls in between the two extremes. This has been called hyperrealism, in which normal proportions and laws of physics apply. Violence in such a style has always been more subject to moral panic than violence in a more ab abstract animation style. The more abstract the style, the more acceptable the portrayal of violence becomes. I guess the original Tom and Jerry cartoons would be an example of that. Watership Down received a universal certificate in the UK because it being animated was thought to mitigate the violence and gore it portrays in itself. The first gory scene, Big League Staring, is contrasted by Summers with Kihar's removal of the shotgun pellets from Hazel's skin by Kihar. The first is urgent and graphic, showing blood and foam coming from his nose and mouth. The second is neither an urgent situation or graphic in its portrayal, though it could have been. At the film's climax, Woundwart's fight with Blackafar and Bigwig is depicted in graphic, gory detail, while the dog attacking the Afrafans above ground is more abstract, with the proportions of the rabbits being killed being stretched and exaggerated. This seems to be done in order to elicit more empathy with Blackafar and Bigwig than with their attackers. Tellingly, the 2018 Netflix adaptation, which uses computer animation that the makers of the 1978 film could only have dreamed of, tones down the violence and gore significantly. Part 4, entitled Effective and Ethical Encounters with the Rabbit, opens with Chapter 12. Forms and Ethics of Animated Violence, written by Joshua Schultz. He begins by saying that Watership Down provides an interesting case study in the use of violence on film, especially as animation still has a peripheral place in film studies. If true, I think that's a real shame. This chapter deals with semiotics, which I haven't studied in many years, using such terms as materiality and indexality, so my reaction to it may not be very rigorous. But the opening argument, which looks at a 1939 film that very unpleasantly featured rabbits actually being killed, seems to amount to the, to the assertion that animals on film are either othered, so as to exclude them from sympathy, or anthropomorphised, meaning they are misrepresented in order to elicit sympathy. Schultz asks, would this rabbit killing scene be any less shocking if it were animated instead? Probably not to many people, even though an animated version wouldn't involve any actual deaths. Or is the appropriate reaction, to use my own example, Chandler's reaction to the film Bambi in Friends? Quote, yes, it was very sad when the guy stopped drawing the deer. End quote. The matter of factness of the killing of rabbits in the highly stylized prologue to the film is discussed as having been a signpost to what will happen later in far more graphic form, with the prologue almost acting as a thematic storyboard for the rest of the film. The storyboard, ironically, is where all films begin, of course, as drawings. The chapter closes with a discussion as to whether anthropomorphizing animals is actually useful in eliciting a genuine sympathy for them, and the prologue is further discussed in its role as presenting the world's creation from a purely lapine perspective, but still written and drawn by humans, of course. Chapter 13 on Watership Down, Rabbit Horror and Suitability for Children is written by the book's editor, Catherine Lester. For me, it was one of the most interesting, as it seems to set out the underlying motivation for the whole book. She begins by dealing with the concept of a killer rabbit as a comedic trope, as it contrasts with their usual image as cute child substitutes in both children's films, as in Peter Rabbit, and in films intended for adults, where harm to rabbits has been used as a sign for potential harm to children, Fatal Attraction being a particularly notorious example. The film's rabbit theme therefore automatically positioned it in many people's minds as a children's film, especially given its universal rating in the UK. This resulted in it being shown on Channel 5 on Easter Sunday afternoon in 2016 and 2017. The media backlash against this, Lester points out, used the infantilising word bunny a lot, especially as it alliterates with such words as bloodbath. 
So the rabbits of the film were both childlike victims as well as being transgressors of their expected role in the film, such as the bloodied wound wart as he makes his final leap at the dog. Lester questions whether this media backlash actually reflected real outrage among the adult population, moral panics often being about perceptions of children in the media rather than reality. Rabbits, being prey animals, are often linked with the vulnerability of children. Yet at the same time, both rabbits and children, especially in films aimed at adults, have often been represented as angels or monsters. For examples of the latter, think of The Omen, 1976, and Donnie Darko, 2001. Many other examples are given. Lester argues that Watership Down, 1978, is effectively a children's horror film, simply because of the way in which it was received, even though it is strictly neither. In the film, the rabbit characters avoid the simple angel-monster dichotomy and are far more nuanced. And central themes of the film, ecological concerns and opposition to tyranny, together with the optimistic ending, do align it with common aspects of children's filmmaking. The focus on its violence and gore, it is argued, has distracted attention away from these more wholesome aspects of the film. In closing, the essay points out that children cannot just be lumped together as all sharing the same reactions to a film. Some children should not see the film. Others very much should. Unfortunately, in the UK in 1978, the parental guidance category was not available, and so the film became notorious for its rating that made out that it was suitable for all children, a rating that only changed in 2022. But, and this is very much my personal view as well, much of its notoriety is also admiration. I am very glad I saw this film at age 11. I hope its new rating does not prevent children who should see it from getting the opportunity. The book closes with chapter 14, Morning Hazel Ra, by Catherine Sadler. It opens by saying that animals' deaths are one of the defining features of our relationship with them as humans, especially as they mostly, they mostly do not live as long as us, I guess. So which animal deaths should we grieve? In fact, more widely, what else should be grieved? Nations? Ideals? The environment? Grieving in those last three senses has been called a political act. In this context, Extinction Rebellion is mentioned. Sadler first saw Watership Down 1978 at age nine, two years younger than me, and regrets the new PG rating. While the violent scene stayed with her, it is the peaceful death of Hazel Ra at the end which made a particular impression. The stilling of Hazel's breath is mentioned as a sight that anyone who has ever been with a pet as they are euthanised will be reminded of. While not many children would have seen this sight when the film came out, they would have in the years that followed, and YouTube comments on the death of Hazel in the film are quoted in order to demonstrate the depth of the resulting feelings on revisiting this scene. I confess myself to be a 56-year-old man who cannot watch it without tearing up. Oddly, though, the song Bright Eyes does not accompany Hazel's death, though its lyrics ask some pretty fundamental questions about death and its seeming injustice. Next, the essay moves on to the idea from studying fairy tales that line between human and animal is more blurred for children and that children being encouraged to feel a kinship with animals was thought in Victorian times to engender certain wider virtues in them. But that kinship could also be a product of the relative powerlessness of the two in an adult world. Speaking personally, I certainly think it is true that attitudes towards animals that children develop at an early age can stay with them into adulthood and that those attitudes can range from the cruel to the compassionate. There follows a discussion about mourning as being an ongoing relationship with the dead, a process that integrates the loss of a grievable life into a new way of living. Increasingly, the passing of grievable animals such as pets are marked in a way that more resembles the way the passing of humans are dealt with. However, there is still pressure in our society to get over it more quickly in the case of a non-human animal. When it comes to rabbits, there is evidence of some women mourning companion rabbits as long ago as the Renaissance. A photograph is included of artist Julia Schlosser, who made an art project of her mourning the loss of her companion rabbit Claire, holding her body. It is very poignant. Other examples of artists and writers being moved to mark the passing of pets are given, but the majority of human-kept rabbits in the world are farmed, and their deaths are not grievable, as is the case with farm animals more widely, I guess. In, a, in the director's cut of the film Donnie Darko, there is a classroom discussion about Watership Down in which Donnie asks why we should mourn Hazel, an animal of a species with no human-like culture and no human-like awareness of death. One of his classmates points out that these rabbits could talk, that the author cared about them and therefore so, so should we. While the idea of an animal having to be more human in order to be mournable is problematic, 
Nevertheless, by feeling sorrow for the passing of the rabbits of Watership Down, Sadler argues, we are transformed as people, made more aware of our relationship to animals, and made the better for that. The end of the book brought me back to these immortal words. My heart has joined the thousand, for my friend stopped running today. Next time, if all goes well, an interview with the editor of the book, Dr Catherine Lester. Thank mm-hmm. you.